labyrinthine musings from the inappropriate shaman. Red, 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 red. For me, Wiltshire is the vibrant heart of old Albion. The numbers of ancient historic sites in the county are an indication of its importance as a prehistoric centre of human civilization. The land itself has a dark, brooding, pagan fecundity full of moist, dank, dark browns. Savanac, the ancient forest of Albion, is still standing full of ancient oaks, an eightfold path at its centre. The energy lines emanating from this central mandala hold deeply throbbing greens and intensely vibrant yellows, which suggest a feminine so full of possibility and mystery that living here was, and is, a privilege. Wiltshire still glimmers and shines, resplendent in late August harvest evenings when the shimmering golden light encapsulates to the eye the feminine feel of this landscape. She has been the muse to ancient circle builders and modern day artists alike. She's beautiful, magical, sensuous and serene. I'm sitting in a stone circle. It's autumn equinox, the moment of equal day and equal night. I'm a healer, holding an old bearded druid's knee in my hands, and having been given to the druid only three days earlier in hospital, this knee was in need of healing. The circle, I say that so casually as it's become a commonplace thing in mine and my family's lives. I found myself drifting off, entering an otherworldly state of mind to allow the healing energies flow through my hands to this poorly knee. Suddenly, my vibration matched and I was shifted into a different time. Same place, different era. The original obelisk still stood at the centre of the sun circle in front of me, reaching high above our heads. I was wearing a cloak which seemed to be of dark feathers. Time shift. Portal opens. You can see the filaments linking. Somehow the air changes colour, frequency, vibration and texture, tripping merrily. Follow the brightest strand on the weird, said a voice. I noticed a luminous fibre connect itself. It was firmly linked to the ancient obelisk. In the old days, a 33-foot, giant, tall stone stood in the centre of the circle. It's not there anymore. Its shadow stands in concrete. But on the shimmering weird, we know it's still there. Gossamer threads all but invisible to the naked eye, but shining, looping this way and that, pulsating with rivers of rainbow light on the energetic planes of the magical landscape. In this altered state of perception, I could see an umbilicus to the heart of the circle established. This year's labyrinth was visioned in. It's arrived. So slight was the anchor, so gentle the movement, it took me a few days to notice the cast of this spell. It's the seventh labyrinth, on the seventh level, I daydream on. When I talk of a portal, this is what I mean. It's in a sight inside, yet connected to the all. Get it right, and the energies of the land can resonate with the vision of the collective conscious, acting like a mirror or a giant size amplifier. Ritual is the vehicle used to link like-mindedness. We call it magic. Magic, creating images of inner sight within a framework to carry an otherworldly vision into ordinary reality. We call practitioners of such arts witches and shaman. I am shaman. Shamanic arts, practiced on a sacred landscape. Magic made accessible to all. This is what the public labyrinth in Avebury is all about. I returned to Earth with a bump. We have been building a labyrinth at Sawain, the old Celtic festival of the dead, held on October 31st for the last six years. This will be the seventh year. Seventh labyrinth. Seventh year. This is a night where the veils between the worlds are at their thinnest.
where communication with the spirit world is the easiest, where energies flow through open portals to the spirit world. I had challenged the druid to his authenticity as the ferryman of the souls across to the river Styx. As we sat there, time shifted with an imperceptible movement into the gateway of the dark. A tiny portal red in its conception, an anchor with weird thread fluttering in the breeze of that warm September afternoon. The door may be open a crack now, but by Samhain, All Hallows Eve, the nights would be drawing in. The dark would be felt. Fires would be lit and the days of hazy autumnal sunshine would be a distant memory. The colours of the labyrinths, the first layer vibrating red, warm, healing, pulsating light leading us through that doorway, red, the colour of base healing, sinews to bone, luminous filaments to stone, follow the brightest strand on the weird. Follow, 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 follow,
My face was warm in the glow of the flames. My heart was aglow in eager expectation of the magic. I could feel the link within myself, the labyrinth link glowing orange and gold. The beautiful lady who set the labyrinth, perfectly proportioned door to the left, I noticed, needed a stick to get all the sawdust laced with paraffin to catch light. My son, Ash, was fortunately carrying his stick his dad had got him because he wanted to practice before he'd buy him a fire staff which he desperately wanted always practical dad always mystical ash the stick has become a fire staff a labyrinth fire staff used for lighting labyrinths once again in an unexpected moment in the divinity of her potent sexuality The orange fibre was cast from the fire labyrinth of the equinox to the Adam and Eve stones of Avebury. Luminous filaments illuminating a potential partnership, a honey-sweet, tippy-toe secret excitement of a possibility from the past reconnecting to the weird and making its presence felt in the now. Tingling sensations where they were forgotten to be, tinkling me inside. I couldn't help but smile sacred sexual union of creation in the eyes of the mother, creativity given fire, given breath, given waters of life, and given deep earth to ground and grow within. The whole exciting dream flows on the weird here. Follow that strand and see where it leads, lighting the sacred stones of the Beckhampton Avenue. I live at this end of the village where the Beckhampton Avenue no longer stands. Just the long stones, Adam and Eve, erect and magnificent in a farmer's bean field. They stand alone. They've never been moved, never relocated or bothered with much. Sacred partners in time. Yellow, 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 yellow. If you stand at the end of our lane and look out across the fields at sunset, you will see Adam and Eve. The sky is more frequently than not streaked, orange, yellow, wide over Windmill Hill. You can see the shimmering indentations where the fallen sarsens lie, toppled in recent history, buried in shallow graves. I often wonder how come all the stones fell in this avenue. That a whole housing estate was built where they processed down into the circle, crossing the Winterbourne with Old Man Willow on the way, 
Silbury Hill standing majestically on your right as you walk down the hillside and fields down into the circles of stone. We've nicknamed this the entrance to the common man. It's been a dormant entrance for a long time. The sites of habitation on Windmill Hill and Cheryl have long since been abandoned and somehow this avenue had become forgotten, quiet in its sleeping state. The odd tourists might find their way down to the long stones, but let's face it, in the glare of the circle, the avenue and Silbury, who really would be interested in two standing stones alone in a field when you have a smorgasbord of Mesolithic monuments all abound? I was. Why? Because this is where the commoners of the day, the doers, the artisans, the builders, the cooks and the bottle washers, mums and dads, the kids and the games all entered where the smiths, the shaman, the weather watchers and the messengers would have come in. The farmers, the builders, the tradesmen and the hawkers, the bards and the musicians bringing their wares, their experiences and their news and their song from the tribal lands far away. This gateway, this portal, was the gateway to the common man then as it is now. I know that because I live here. All that come to visit are exactly that, the commoners. We don't have cloaks and staffs. We don't have magical circles and incantations. We have kids and a busy life where we care about our environment and whether the recycling gets put out on high days and holy days. We are the common men and the common women of the common land. The yellow thread is woven down the avenue into the circle.
green 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 home is where the heart is It's been a process making my home in a sacred temple. Looking back now, not exactly sure what possessed me to undertake such a leap, other than blind faith and an unerring feeling that I was meant to be here. Home is where the heart is. Dreams, love, passion, mysterious whispering in old oak groves, visits to the visionary Wayland Smithy, who, let's face it, was wayward, philandering with fair maidens. I was married then. Now I have an ex-husband and an ex-partner who's coupling with my ex-best friend. I have an ex-life, an old life and a new one. Phoenix, we shall call her, from the ashes. The phone rings and I answer it, thinking it would be my ex-husband, Chris, wanting to speak to the kids. It's not, it's Frank. You sound hurried, he says. I'm not, I'm baking pies with the kids, I reply. And then he lets the bombshell drop. I can hear the whistling of the shell as the crater is formed in my mind. I've got you a commission, Shaman Sam. I can feel the butterflies emerge from a chrysalis of fear and disbelief and excitement. Me, radio, mind, music, listening, all happen as the steaming homity pie emerges from the hot oven, filling the kitchen with the smell of melted cheese, garlic and potato. Mmm, I think, and allow the pie to sit, like my mind, rest in the delicious enormity of the potential of a delicious fulfilment. The moment was that, a moment broken by the intensity of children shouting, Is tea ready, Mum, and it's Simpsons o'clock? Meaning the bell had struck six and tea was to be served, no matter how hard I have worked to break the routine of the Simpsons o'clock with suggestions of eating together as a family. No matter what state I'm in, and whether I like it or not, it's time. The show must go on. I have been in some interesting spaces and places when that theme tune begins. Once we were testing dosage on a new bottle of Lucy. It was very strong. I was entirely incapable of serving tea. Today was not one of those. Despite an early 8am start at the physio, sorting out a chronic pain in my hip, a visit to the bank, £6.92 overdrawn and 10 days till the end of the month, a long and emotional phone call earlier with the kid's dad, the arrival of a homeopathic client who was stubbornly persisting with a crack habit despite the arrival of a second child and the baking of pies, I was still able to smile answer the phone, serve the dinner to the theme tune at the prescribed time in an almost appropriate fashion. A bit hurried, I think you could say that. So real. Silbury is where the green link lies. And I lie atop a Silbury. An archaeologist neighbour of mine once triangulated the top floor of our homes to the height of Silbury. I like this. When I lie in bed, I feel connected to her, to the mother, to the creatrix, to the heart. She connects me to all the mothers that have gone before me, all the mothers that walk alongside me, and all the mothers to come. In the moment of stillness, as Pi is being demolished in the other room, all is quiet in my kitchen. I notice the butterflies emerging from the chrysalis, their manifold, layered, wavy, so pale, those light gossamer wings that they lift my spirits. The pie was good. It tasted right. Leftovers transformed in the womb of the oven into a majestic pie creation by all of us. Not me preparing the dinner to serve no matter what. This was us three, me, Emma and Ash, creating something good. Something good from the old. 
the lightness and brightness of Frank's suggestion, sent through on the wings of those tickling, wriggling butterflies, brought the smile and the dread, the dark and the light, the contrast, the possibility of success and failure, or at the very least, exposure. The world wide web would hear, I have no idea at this moment as to whether the pie will be homity or blackbird. I baked a crow pie once, a long time ago. It was one of those events I'd almost managed to erase from my mind, but I told a rainbow friend of mine who's so bright on the weird it almost hurts to look at him. I told him about the crow pies I once baked. I had explained to him that I probably killed off a few old ladies in this culinary disaster. I always remember those chocolates, violet creams, made by a small chocolatier on Lord Street in Southport where I was born. I called them violet screams. One of our old ladies who became very sick after eating the meat pie I baked really was called Violet, violently screaming. Needless to say, I did not last very long as a cook in this old people's home as the epidemic of food poisoning culled a few of the residents and my services were terminated. Crow pie, tasty death. Always was good at a light pastry though. Even my domestic science teacher had remarked while I was still at school. Lightness of touch in the pastry department, she said. Maybe it's genetic. The pastry tonight was like too buttery and light like the butterflies in my tummy. Since my daughter's request that we live in a vegetarian household had been recently heard and accepted, we were not even considering the possibility of crow pie. Homity, it definitely is. It's so easy to get lost in the labyrinth. When I'm in it, the lostness, the haziness, and usually the sadness, but feelings nonetheless, I find myself more and more bringing myself to my heart centre, to my family and my home. My inner sanctuary, a place of calm, and from here, in all the cacophony and background noise of my busy day-to-day -day life, I can assess, usually sat by the fire, where I'm at within the labyrinth of my own life. Am I in a fiery survival red mode? Or a just get on and do it yellow mode? Or a keep calm and carry on green family mode? Or is it I need to speak and communicate to myself, to divine or to sleep? From the green heart light emits the point where we find ourselves going backwards and forwards in the elusive matrix of the labyrinth asks us, have I been here before? Am I even going the right way? It's a slightly panicky question. It's designed like that, life, here to catch you on unawares and slowly recognising milestones, curves and paths that feel aligned and kindred to where we've been before. But this time as we walk, the wisdom of experience guides us through. Illumination. We all get lost in the labyrinth. It's designed that way. It's designed that way.
blue 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 leads me to communication I seem to be having a strange time with mobile phones in my home no one's works my friends from London come and get very annoyed and confused as to why there is such erratic reception in my home. Texts come days late, then all at once, phones bleep and vibrate, revealing their secret messages to eagerly anticipatory minds. There must have been quite a lot of people around recently from so many different areas of the country to be noticing it quite at the level that we are. Communication within different vibratory spheres auditory hallucinations until we realize we are all having them in our sleep in our dreams in our journeys whilst we're making the tea auditory hallucinations it's almost like tuning a radio when the static disappears on twiddling the knob and hearing a clear voice slice through your mind like that only there's no radio auditory hallucinations after the labyrinth when me crow and a few others were sipping whiskey and lauding ourselves for a job well done did crow remember did you hear voices from the other side he blurted out rather unexpectedly and each one of our faces registered surprise we all realized we've been hearing the same things or at least the shared quality of what we'd heard clear as if being transmitted from a long way away, yet a place that resonates with the stones of Avebury, suggested another friend. Maybe it was one of our friends traversing the weird to meet us, suggested somebody else. It was a friendly sort of voice, yet determined we would hear someone else mentioned. None of us knew what it was, but we had all heard it. These thoughts ebbed away into the slow grey light of the early dawn. The druids had partied hard all night and completed the rites for the dead by passing soulful apples over the swallowhead spring in the morning. The musicians at the village hall had decanted to fire song and laughter late into the night. The drummers had headed up to the barrow to raise the vibrations of the land and the labyrinth stood vibrantly lit in the moon circle. My house was very quiet. In the soft light and sleepy heads, it was easy to forget about the sounds of the labyrinth. I just kept hearing people talking about how poor Avebury is at getting any reception of any form of media broadband, phone, whatever. Something here suppresses the activity of communication in an ordinary way. It asks us to stay awake to the hypnotic spell put over us by a reliance on technology. There are stronger forces at work here. There are older forces at work here. I don't worry about feelings of social alienation that you might have if you don't know what's happening on TV or what the best fashion is or whether your computer works or whether you have to stand in a freezing cold conservatory to send a text as you do in my house. We're used to it. It's just at the moment my attention is drawn to something else. It's sowing. It's a time and a place where the worlds are at their closest. The veils are so thin the connections are so strong, it's the darkest time, it's the best time and the easiest time to traverse the world, traverse our worlds into otherworldly states, hear otherworldly voices and wonder what the messages are.
The third eye, allowing ourselves to see with clarity. The fire labyrinth was alight. Ash's stick from Coyd Hill's labyrinth was used to stir the cauldron in the centre alive. The labyrinth had been built earlier in the day, mown to the ground. We had a lantern making session last Thursday. A womanly joyful day, those nimble fingers making and creating lanterns made of willow. The tissue paper was torn into flames of red and gold for the fire, our salamanders. Swirling clouds of blue sky for the air. Sylphs, green and brown gnomes, earth, undines and blues for the water. Elementals were invoked to hold the quarters within the fire labyrinth. It was a ladies' day. We haven't had one of those for a while with pirates and fairies, sick kids and half-term. But I hadn't realised the importance of this creative day. Come to think of it, we've never built lanterns for the labyrinth before. Tried tea lights blowing out in the wind, tried paper bags with sand. But this year, we're connecting in a more womanly way to make lanterns of willow and paper. Just a nice thing to do. Hadn't given it much thought other than it will be a nice thing to see where we're going. Usually it's too dark in that labyrinth and we all get lost. People can't find us. We need illumination, I cried. Last year I'd stood in the middle as crone, Hecate with a bonfire and a cauldron and spent a couple of hours with eyes streaming in the smoke. The physical discomfort intense, thirst, heat and smoke veiled lighting night lights in our labyrinth for our walkers. Our magic was to open the portal between the worlds. It was chaos. It was accurate. The ending of that old year, releasing all that had been done, was a tough job and not for the faint-hearted. I wasn't so enthusiastic to endure all that again, and this year had been a very different one. So we prepared ourselves a little better this year. Crow coordinated and the women created. I found myself once again traversing the labyrinth to her centre when I was met with a cauldron of kitty litter. Yes, kitty litter, with flaming oil to keep it alight. I raised my eyebrows. It was amazing. There was no smoke, just fire, magic. All around me, people I thought I recognised shapeshifted into tricksters and hunters, waylaymen and highwaymen. Drummers and musicians spread around the circle with sound. Ladies' voices sang softly on the breeze. The moon was out, nearly full, lighting the landscape with her pale white lunar light. She made it easy, slipping into the black robes of the Morrigan, veiled and dark. I disappeared and she arrived in my place. Afterwards, when people talked to me, they told me they didn't realise it was me, Sam, my really good friends, yet I knew that was true because I couldn't recognise anyone either. Our spirits were dancing, the labyrinth action as a place where spirits of Sawain, of Avebury, of the Fay Court, Seely and Unseely, could express themselves without humans getting in the way. The man from the Swindon advertiser was politely asked to leave. Participation was necessary, getting lost on the way was essential, we had become archetypal, energies of the land. I called in the Morrigan. Whoosh! I saw the first quarter lit with a fire poi. A voice boomed as the circle was cast with fire. Whoosh! The resonant noise of flame through air. Fire poi alight. We took flight. Whoosh! Whoosh! All the directions cast. The drumming, singing, heat, fire, chaos calmly fell away into the opening of the third eye. The indigo realm was close. The Morrigan entered from the west gate and she gave us illumination. Dark, black, velvet, background held in lunar light. The colours of the labyrinth shone so brightly with soulful brilliance, with red on the outside, warming people to give them energy. Drum, drummers, I found myself thinking. Sing, sing, ladies. Ancient, runic chants, galder and whispering, word weaving, illuminating. Oranges and yellows of passion and action. The green layer was cool and caught the traveller for a moment. 
asking them to take stock of their heart. Are you living with loving kindness? Are your heart's desires being fulfilled? The blues and the turquoises and indigos asking us to communicate with our soul guides, our higher selves, our angelic hosts of loving support and see what's really needed to be released from the old year to the centre, to the goddess, to the reality of the release, to the morrigan, to death, the purity, sharpness, illumination of the colours of that labyrinth were beyond description. Not even dreamlike, they were so real, so vibrant, a rainbow maze, I found it amazing. Like it always was there, it just wanted us to access her, crystal skull-like, holding secrets in the past ready to be heard in the now, opening portal to our psyches and the collective unconscious with fam archetypal familiarity, common unity, healing our minds in our community, opening the keys to the medicine chest to our own illumination, flooding our systems with unexpected light. Purple, 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 brings us to the centre of our labyrinth and to soul flight. And there the Morrigan waited with an open space. Flaming cauldron in front of her, drop the paper into the fire, wait for it to light, then flash. The old year had gone, the death of outworn ways and the opening of intuitive spiritual understanding of the transformation and transmutation that fire can bring. The dark goddess can bring, the triple aspect of the Morrigan can attune you to. In that intuitive flash, answers were given. Imagination soared, flames burned brightly. We could tune into whatever we wanted to or needed to. The labyrinth was open. We resonated so strongly on the weird with great accuracy. I remember this feeling from a long time ago in the old days. I knew though, this time, I got there standing on my own two feet. Nobody was propping me up this time. It was in the centre of the labyrinth I stood alone. Avebury, seven years, seven layers of the labyrinth. I'm 42, it was complete, I'd done it. Relief washed over me as the fire was taken from the centre to light the fire of the new year. I knew I was done. I fell out of the labyrinth, laughing, given cake, mead, told to ground, which all I could do was laugh at. Oh, bless my beautiful friends. Slowly, very slowly, I descended through the stratosphere, down, down, down. To my body. I was reducing my size, yet becoming more concentrated. The colours and qualities, hopes and dreams, commitments and fantasies associated with each layer for each one of us was amplified in the sacred arena. Me, Sam, returning from shamanic crow flight. Crow is the Morrigan's totem and she lives here. We're in the moon circle, with the sun circle, ancient sacred temple. The priests and priestesses watch this illumination of a nodal point of Gaia, and the ancestors nod. We were doing a great job, and I smiled as I flew by. Avebury awakens slowly, revealing her mysteries delicately and gently. She understands we are but grains of sand, and time is on her side. And time, time is on her side. 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 Thank you.
Oh, 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 oh.